All right, Kenneth. Hey, dude. Um, thank you for doing this. Um, greatly appreciate it. I, I don't think we've ever met in person, but obviously, um, your fellow fund managers in the industry respect you and have recommended you. And I think uh, you've got interesting points of view in terms of value investing. And I, I mean, obviously, the the world's most famous uh, value investor is uh, Warren Buffett himself, and Charlie Munger, his partner in Berkshire Hathaway. Um, I guess we just start in the context of um, your background in fund management and um, I get, I'll, I'll let you do the introductions because you can do it best yourself. So sure, thanks, Chuang. Thanks for the opportunity. Um, I guess I've always been interested in the stock market, even from a very young age. So when I was in university, I actually won um, a stock picking competition in my second year there. Uh, that was hosted by Oxford University and Mercury Asset Management at that point in time before it got bought over by BlackRock and all that kind of stuff. Uh, so I've always been interested in the stock market, no, no idea why, um, but essentially, you know, like um, I'm already in my mid forties. So I spent the last 20 over years looking at the equity markets, the stock markets, basically from different angles. Um, my first job was in London after university. I uh, graduated as, uh, I graduated from, with a degree in economics and management from the, the University of Oxford. And then I started, um, uh, to, and I trained as a chartered accountant with Deloitte and Trish in London, uh, focusing on the financial services sector. Uh, after doing that for three years, then I joined, uh, a, a cell, I, I, then I became a sell side analyst with Climate Benson, uh, and we were covering the tech sector at that point in time. So, you know, like, um, even from, so that was um, in the heydays of the dot-com uh, bubble actually in 1999. So I started work in uh, February uh, 2000. There were 22 of us in the European technology research team. And when I left three years later, basically everybody, almost everybody around me had been fired and we were down to like eight people. Um, my, so that was a very good, you know, like uh, uh, baptism of fire basically into uh, into the stock market and equity research where we basically saw you know like uh, the boom uh, and then the bus um, and had a really good front row seat you know like uh, from a very early young age and had a really really good boss uh, he taught me a lot and you know like our team was the only thing that was not fired basically because we had a differentiated view so we were the European semiconductor research team and it, and it comprised of basically two Indians, one Malaysian, myself, and a guy from Singapore. And we were the European Semiconductor Research Team. Uh, it, it was just basically, we were just bringing a different perspective uh, to the whole uh, market. When my boss used to work in, uh, in uh, Singapore and Hong Kong, um, and he was taking data points from uh, um, Taiwan in Korea, and basically, you know, like uh, feeding into the European market. So that was a different, very, very, very different perspective. And that, was where we started, you know, like gaining some traction from being nobodies to being top three rank within two, three years. Oh, incredible. Uh, incredible. So, so obviously, you know, you've got your background in the financial crisis. You've been around the block a couple of times, and I think that's key because a lot of the new investors and um, fund managers, they, they haven't seen the boom and bust cycles, right? They only know what they know from university and from the history books. If, in fact, they even do <laughs> look at the history books. Um, so, so your your patch of the woods is, is Southeast Asia, right? And actually, no, not not necessarily. You look at the whole world. You've got um, this fund which is run out of uh, Singapore, uh, the Gao Global Fund, right? And your your patch is basically to look at the value investments. And I just want to talk about how it's this is two different temperatures going on in the world. In America, it's very frothy. It's very um, risk on. That's what the investors like. So there's a lot of activity in the share markets. It's you know. It, it's chalking record after record, but in ASEAN, where we, where we are, there's a lot of fear in the markets, right? So just, just in the context of the different sentiments from the two parts of the world, explain the, your value investing philosophy. What are the mechanics behind it? Sure. So basically, you know, like um, it always boils down to numbers, right? Uh, to valuation and financial uh, statements. So I pay a lot of attention to, uh, to valuation. And I look at valuation across time, uh, looking at historical cycles to see, you know, like where the peaks and troughs have been. And I try to figure out where we are uh, in relation to those peaks and troughs, okay? Um, and then at the same time, I look at um, um, absolute valuations as well. And PE doesn't really help me with that because PE is, is sort of goes all over the place depending on profitability. 
Um, if you look at, you know, like the last 12 months, there's been, a, um, most companies have been loss making. So P is not uh, very useful that way. So I, so I sort of, you know, like tend to use uh, price to book uh, to help me figure out where we are in terms of the cycles and where we are on an absolute basis as well. So regardless of whether you're looking at a stock in this part of the world or in the US or, 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 or whatever, I try to make a apples to apples comparison to figure out um, whether there's actually value or I'm sort of kidding myself, right? Um, so for example, to the common man, you know, like if you only buy food from Taman Desa, you think that, you know, like chicken rice in Taman Desa is the best. But when you sort of expand that, that universe from Taman Desa to Klang Valley, maybe the Taman Desa chicken rice is not the best. Maybe there's better chicken rice elsewhere. So I try not to fool myself. You know, like I, I try to um, analyze everything on a flat playing field, uh, flat playing field. And, and, you know, like in this day and age, um, I use, uh, it's quite easy to do so because there's a lot of financial data out there. Um, so what has happened is that at any one point in time, I just go back to um, analyzing numbers and figuring out where we are. Um, in the depth of the crisis last year, for example, when things were really, really bad, I found this stock called Signet Jewelers. Um, it is the largest US jewelry store um, um, and they basically are number one in the US and number one in the UK as well, okay? But in the sell down post COVID, um, it traded on to 0 0.3 times price to book. Whereas in this part of the world, the, the, the equivalent from Malaysia is basically Pokong. Pokong traded on to about 0 0.8 times price to book. And Chai Tao Fok um, uh, in Hong Kong traded on to about 0 0.7, 0 0.8 times, uh, times price to book as well, right? So it didn't make sense for basically the US number one retailer of jewelry to trade down to such a low valuation and such a massive discount uh, to the ones traded in Asia. Um, especially given that, that basically, you know, like um, we saw pretty strong uh, fundamentals and quarterly results coming out of the US. So what has happened was that that one was severely mispriced. Um, it, it, it sold down um, to 0 0.3 times price to book. And since then, basically um, for the fund it has been, uh, it's gone up 600, 700% something like that, uh, it, 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 it still remains in the portfolio because I, because I don't think that the, the whole mispricing cycle has ended. Okay, so there's a lot of issues there, which we will definitely get into uh, just in terms of stock selection, in terms of how long you keep the stock for and how much more upside you think there is. But just in terms of um, the idea of stocks being mispriced, right? Uh, we think that the share markets are very efficient pricing mechanisms, which they're not because they um, are reflections of human sentiment and essentially human greed and fear, which are the two basic human emotions that guide uh, market prices, right? Um, why, when you, when you look at mispriced stocks, right, what are the barometers for understanding whether it's time to go in? Um, I, I know 0 0.3 times book value is it's, it's pretty strong because there's only 0.3 more to go to zero, which it will never get to zero, right? And Pokong gets to 0.8%. But just in terms of the numbers, and, and, and I guess also one more thing, to what extent do you gauge human emotion in terms of your um, um, selection process? Uh, so from a personality point of view, I'm actually quite um, unemotional, for better or for worse, right? Uh, it's just the way I am. So, and I sort of, you know, like sort of look at things from a very detached point of view. And it helps me with, um, with what I do, investing in the stock market, where I can sort of, you know, like look at things and analyze things very impartially. So I really look just at numbers. And then when it comes to basically figuring out where we are in terms of the cycles, um, I've seen quite a lot, right? So as I shared, I started my career uh, at the depths of the dot-com uh, bubble in 2000. And then after that, um, after, after spending six years working in London, I came back to KL. I worked here for five years at CMB Investment Bank for most of that time. Um, and I was a fund manager for the prop desk there before moving to Jakarta in 2007, where I was covering the Indonesian market first as research analyst and then as head of equity sales. So, and then I saw, um, so when I was in Indonesia, I also saw the boom and bust where um, when I first uh, went to Jakarta, nobody wanted to talk about Indonesia at all. It was like the paria, it was like, it could be, it could be not, and nobody was in, uh, interested. And then you basically had coal prices going all the way up to like $160 a ton. Uh, and then suddenly everybody knew Bumi Resources. Uh, it was the largest stock in Indonesia and everywhere, right? Uh, we, I, I still remember that we were, we were marketing in the US and we went to Baltimore 
and you know like the fund manager there actually knew about Indonesia. So when you know like somebody in uh, deepest darkest America knows about Indonesia and can name stocks in Indonesia, you sort of realize, oh okay, um, this cycle has ran quite a bit already. Um, so you sort of so so like you know like I've seen boom and bust, and, and and then like the last um and then and then so like the in in the global financial crisis. Um, Indonesia basically was a uh, bust, there was a massive boom, and then it busted again, where basically they decided to suspend trading on the stock market for like two, three weeks, right? Uh, so that was another bust. And then from the ashes of that, basically stocks had a massive run uh, after that, um, because everybody sort of realized eventually that it was, a, it was basically a credit problem primarily in the US, nothing to do with structural growth uh, in Indonesia. That, that that had been basically been carrying on since uh that had been carrying on since 2002 and continues to uh unfold up to this day um and then you know like the last one we had was uh COVID last year where everything sort of crashed down um at the start of uh 2020 everybody was very very greedy um it, it was it, it was shaping up to be a very very good year and then COVID hit um and then sentiment just turned massively and it just felt out there that you know like everybody was sort of running for shelter because the sky was about to fall down but if you sort of take a step back you look at things you yes so some sectors will be impacted by covid and the whole social distancing and staying at home but other sectors would do well we're not, so, so we saw you know like things like zoom do well and all that and peloton um i don't invest in any of those but but like you know like once once things sort of um settled down and um, you, you know, like um, it was sort of easy to see what businesses would be massively impacted, and what would actually benefit, and countries as well, depending on you know like how they responded to the virus. So twelve months ago, uh, the fund was um, about 15, 20 percent invested in Australian domestic stocks, because the Australian government had sort of shown a pretty uh, solid response to COVID by locking up the borders and sort of controlling it. So we saw consumer demand sort of bounce back quite nicely in Australia, um, but then that sort of plateaued because you know like from the initial uh, mis-selling, it bounced back to where, what was fair value, and then after that there was no no more chance to grow because borders in Australia still remain shut. So the thing is that at any one point in time, I would say that you know stocks in the market, about ninety percent of them are fairly priced at any one point in time, but that leaves or. So that leaves another 10% that are mispriced at any one point in time as well, right? Um, but that distribution of that 10% that of mispriced stocks varies according to sectors and countries over time. Um, I, sus I guess that that was Australia one year ago, but, you know, I don't think that that is the case today. Uh, you know, like, uh, so it sort of varies. Okay, so, so, so the lessons that you're proffering today, um, I, I think is, is very clear. You look purely at the numbers, you look purely at valuations, you don't look at emotions, you don't, in fact, you rarely speak to management, which is very, very rare, because a lot of fund managers actually make it a point to attend shareholder meetings and have these one-on-one -on -one discussions with CFO, CFOs and CEOs, right? We'll talk about that. You also rarely look at PEs, you look at more PBs, price books, and you also analyze cash flows, right? And cash flows is very interesting because you don't necessarily look at profit after tax, which again is quite contrarian. Can you explain those principles? Sure. Um, so the thing is that, look, um, if, you, if you take a step back, you don't talk to stock market investors, you talk to a businessman, right? And you ask a businessman, you know, like, how do you increase sales? It's very simple. You just give looser credit terms. If Chuang, if you own a business and you basically tell, and you start selling the cushions in your background there, and you basically say, you know, like, I give you one year credit terms, your sales will rocket. You do really, really well, right? But but uh, so you know, like your PL would show massive growth, but cash flow wise, you're in a bit of a pickle because you actually don't have working capital to basically fund it, right? So that's why I sort of find that um, uh, thinking like a businessman uh, rather than a stock market investor sort of helps me understand businesses better. So I sort of figure out uh, what the cash flow of the business is. And a lot of times I actually like buying into companies that have over expanded in the past. So they spent too much money on CapEx, they built this massive factory, and then the market just went away from them. So they're 30% utilization. And then if I buy into um, the stock at a point in time, I'm basically getting a fully built factory for very, very little money. 
because I didn't pay for it because I am a brand new shareholder. I wasn't a historical shareholder. I didn't pay for that capex. But going forward, if orders were to increase and utilization was to go from 30% to 70%, I, would, I, I as a new shareholder would basically benefit from that. Um, so I sort of, so that's where, you know, like um, an appreciation of cycles comes in handy, I find, where you sort of figure out where the boom and bust are and every sector goes through that boom and bust where super normal profits attract more competition, more competition leads to more supply, more supply leads to prices coming down, prices coming down leads to some, some companies um, making losses and then they go out of business. Then they go to a business and then there's consolidation um, and then they are careful for a while. And then after a while, you know, they become reckless or new people come into uh, the market. So, you know, like this is a tale as old as time. Um, that's the beauty of it, right? So the things you just have to be mindful, watch out for it um, and just pick your spots where you sort of see this cycle playing out. So obviously, um, you know, when we, when you talk in these terms, you you recall that um, the glove makers, which had a huge year last year, but this year they've really come off, right? And a lot of them have invested in capacity, including a lot of new players like the Marsings of this world and there's this Harps, this new company. But you don't look at glove makers, you look predominantly in the region and in the US, right? Um, why don't you look at Malaysia? So, okay, so... Um... So the fund was actually invested in glove makers for a very short period of time last year, because at one point in time, it was, it was, it was looking very, very promising where there was a demand supply imbalance. Uh, supply was limited. Demand was very strong because COVID was breaking out all over the world. So there was massive pricing power. The glove companies were coming on telling you about how they were increasing prices by 10, 20% month on month. Right. Um, and like there's a queue of orders, all that kind of stuff. So in the short term, it was really, really good. But what happened was that then, because it, the, the profits of the sector were so super normal, it attracted a whole bunch of people in, into the sector, the likes of Masing um, and the Chinese as well. What people, the pe what people had, did not focus on was the supply response. Everybody looked at demand and saying that, you know, uh, demand for gloves would be very strong because COVID is here or hygiene levels, or et cetera, et cetera. That is, uh, without a doubt, you know, demand is going to be strong. But the thing is that supply can increase a lot faster than demand. Demand can increase 5, 10, 15% per year. But the supply response is essentially the global supply of rubber gloves is about to triple in the next three years. Some crazy number like that, where, you know, like the number, like the amount of supply is going to go up by three times. When you have that kind of supply response, you basically have price as the clearing mechanism. So price will fall and has started falling already. And if you go back to, you know, like basics again, uh, revenue equals quantity times price. One if your time. price halves, your quantity doubles, your revenue is still flat. Yeah, 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 yeah. So obviously th those right. dynamics, so that, mm -hmm. yeah, sorry, go on. No, so, so you know, like you, you sort of have to um, understand the supply response um, and how quickly can basically somebody enter this industry to figure out how long your your period of super normal profit is. For somebody like Massing, that has never is a property developer, to suddenly enter the glove business and to you know like have their products roll out within 12 months, sort of suggests that barriers to entry are kind of low. Right? So like pricing power might not be there. Yeah. Whereas, for example, I've been trying I've been trying to invest in, in, in like in like stocks or industries where the supply response will take forever. Um, the best example is container shipping, uh, which has which has been a significant contrib contribution to our performance for the fund uh, for the last 12 months. Where you know, if you and I were to basically decide we wanted to order a ship today, we would only take delivery in two to three years time. So you know, like there is no supply response within 12 months. In the next 12 months, there is no new ships coming onto the market. Yeah, so so let's talk about those dynamics because what happened with the glove makers, right? I think you spotted it early, and you you saw your rules being contravened. You you saw that the deep value that was um that you seek is no longer there. You saw that the margin of safety that you normally um s s search for is is no longer there because of the proliferation of players. So then you go around the world, right? And and you, when you talk about evergreen, evergreen is that uh, is it Taiwanese? 
the container, one of the biggest in the world, right? With along with Musk and Neptune and you know the other big players. Um, you that was another big uh, multi bagger for you guys, right? Can can you explain your first of all how you found Evergreen and how you settled on Evergreen and you know putting the money where your um, conviction was, right? And then that whole process and staying with it. Can you can you describe that process? Sure. Uh, um. So every day I spend about, I don't know, five to six hours reading uh, different sources, research reports, news, um, just everywhere, just to get data points to figure out, you know, like what is happening in the world. Um, most of it is not relevant at this point in time, but it's just to keep um, on top of things. Um, and then towards the end of last year, around October, November timeframe, um, I, I came across some reports that basically said, you know, like there is congestion and container shipping rates have been uh, trending up quite nicely. Um, I'm fairly familiar with container shipping, having looked at it before in the past. Um, MISC many, many years ago used to own a container shipping company, but basically container shipping, so going back to cycles again, container shipping has been a terrible cycle for 20 years. It's been a terrible cycle for 20 years. There used to be 30, 40 container shipping companies 30 of them have gone bankrupt. So there are only 10 container shipping companies left. So it's been a terrible industry to be in where, you know, like there's been just oversupply. Um, oversupply rates are down. Nobody makes any money. Um, so it's just basically, you know, like you're, you're, you're left with 10 people, uh, 10 players left in this industry. Um, and post COVID, it didn't look very good. But what happened was that um, you had all the governments every, all around the world trying to simulate, stimulate their economy. Um, I likened this to basically, you know, like when you plan a highway, you sort of look at traffic flows back and forth over a period of time and sort of, you know, try to optimize for that. But what has happened is that, you know, like post COVID, it's as if everybody's go headed in the same direction and leaving the house at the same point in time. So there's a massive bottleneck. Um, and there's no way of basically clearing that uh, backlog anytime soon, given that the highway only has three lanes or four lanes or whatever it is, right? Um, so the only clearing mechanism in this case, once again, is price. So the pricing of container shipping has doubled and then now it's tripled. And every week it keeps on going up still because uh, the supply response is coming, but it won't be here for another couple of years. When we, when we first bought into Evergreen Marine, uh, it was not the only stock that we bought into in container shipping. So we, so we, so we hedge our bets. Um, we invested into about uh, three or four container shipping companies, including Evergreen Marine. At that point in time, Evergreen Marine was trading about one times price to book. Um, and essentially, since then, it's gone up uh, tenfold. So, you know, like it, it was a 10 bagger for the ASV fund within a span of um, eight months. Uh, <laughs> so that was uh, lucky uh, that it happened in such a short space of time. Uh, but one to be cherished because 10 baggers don't happen very often. My last 10 bagger was about 10 years ago. So, you, you know, um, and, and to have it happen in eight months, uh, yeah, just got very, very lucky with the timing there. But essentially the fundamentals are not improving. Uh, and then you had, um, um, you, you had ever given, uh, stuck in the Swiss Canal, uh, you had COVID cases in the ports and all that, uh, where basically there is just congestion everywhere and everybody wants their stuff to be shipped on time, uh, higher value items, uh, you know, like try to push their way to the front. But basically there is, for a world that was basically built on just in time, uh, at this point in time, it is just not coping. And so so if you are the bottleneck, you are basically benefiting from what, what's happening in the world, right? At this point in time. Kenneth, can, can I just get your point of view, right? Because what you've just described to me seems so almost common sense that anybody can spot it, right? Uh, let alone the professional fund managers. First of all, you've got this return to normalcy because governments are past prime priming and everybody is clamoring to get back into everyday life. You've also got the fact that the super tanker, well, the tanker industry has consolidated to just 10 big players, right? You've also got the public data points about how Evergreen is trading at one time book value, which for a conglomerate like that is bloody cheap, right? Um, and you've got all these factors in play but then you describe your 10-bagger as not only just luck, but the last time you had it was 10 years ago. So how is it that, you know, these, these, these points are missed by almost everybody except for the select few? Um, 
how is that possible? Is, is it is the, so so no? Because so, so it, I, it's actually quite hard. Yeah, it, it, it's timing. No, it, partly, it, it's, right? uh, it, no, it's a mindset thing. So I realize that basically to to think in terms of cycles is actually very very hard. Um, where so normally people will basically. Uh, be fearful and be very, very fearful thinking that, you know, like the next one year, two years will be terrible or when things are doing really well, they sort of think to infinity and beyond. It is really hard to basically think in terms of cycles and figure out when to get off um, uh, the, the cycle. Uh, and it's just, I guess, it's just that I, I guess I've seen a lot over my 20 years, you know, like I started to work in London, I saw boom and bust there. I, then I was in Jakarta, I saw boom and bust. Um, so I've seen boom and bust a couple of times uh, in different environments and they always look the same. Um, so perhaps I have a better appreciation of this boom and bust cycle um, that has happened everywhere. So I still remember, you know, like um, after spending three, four years in Indonesia, then I wanted to go visit the Philippines. And that was a really good trip because, you know, like just going to the Philippines you sort of realize that the Philippines was just like Indonesia, but 10 years behind. You know, it, it's the same cycle playing out again. It's just uh, a bit, it's just at a different stage of the cycle. Um, and what helped me in Indonesia was coming from Malaysia, where I looked at the prosperity and the development that Malaysia had. And I knew that Indonesia would sort of get there eventually. When I first moved to Jakarta, for example, and I, I was covering Astra International, the largest conglomerate, which is a bit like Sindawi here. Um, Indonesian total automotive sales was 400,000 units per year. And in Malaysia at that point in time, we were doing about 700,000 units per year. Thailand was 800,000 units per year. And Indonesia was 400,000, okay? Um, the analysts in Indonesia, because they had been used to that 400,000 uh, units per year number forever, they had only forecasted, you know, like a 3%, 5% growth every year because they had been used to that kind of number. Whereas I sort of came in with a fresh perspective, fresh viewpoint and said, look, you know, like if, if Malaysia, a country that is, you know, 10% the size of Indonesia and we, and we sell 700,000 cars a year, why is it that Indonesia is only doing 400,000? You know, like, so there's no forecasting. It's just realizing that it was just too small. Um, so that 400,000 number basically uh, rose to more than a million uh, eventually, right? Um, and potentially it could, re it could go up to 200, it could go up to 2 million car sales per year. We're not there yet, but you know, like now Indonesia is the largest car market in, uh, in ASEAN. Yeah. I, okay. I want to get further into your head on this, right? Because um, you say you spend five to six hours a day reading up, but then you don't listen to CNBC. You don't watch Bloomberg TV. Uh, you don't meet management. Um, and then you look at data metrics and the, these data metrics are available to everybody, right? So you've, you've done calls on, you've, you've got multi-bagger calls on um, Evergreen. You've done multi-bagger calls on Signet. Um, and I, I look through your, some of your list. You've also got Supermax in there, but I think that's the sole Malaysian representative. So um, what do you read? How, what do you read to get your stock selections? Um, and what gives you the trigger to just put the money where your conviction is? Because that's the second step, right? There's two steps. One is to read. Well, actually, no. There's 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 a few, right? But to 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 buy and when to sell, right? So let's look at the buying element first. What gives you the conviction to buy after having made up your mind? And and what do you read to get those stock selections? Okay, the decision to buy and sell, um, or the decision to buy is essentially, um, I go back to first. I, I it always goes back to first principles. Okay, um, I'm trying to basically. I'm, I'm, I'm essentially trying to double um, my money every five years. So I'm looking at a compounded rate of 15% per year, one five, okay? In order to get, but, but then the things that, you know, like things never go, go according to plan. So in order to get 15% on a portfolio basis, I'm looking at stocks that can go up at least 50%, five zero. Um, given that, you know, like the hit rate of uh, stocks that actually go up versus stocks that actually go down, regardless of how much work you put into it, it's about, 55, 60%, okay? So I'm looking for stocks that can go up at least 50%. So by that, it sort of eliminates a lot of stocks that I uh, that are out there. So I don't look at a lot of the mega caps. I don't look at a lot, a lot of the blue chips. I don't look at telcos, for example, utilities. I don't look at property companies. 
Um, so by a process of elimination, I get rid of a lot, a lot of stuff and I narrow my focus onto what is important. And what is important sort of varies over time as well because everything moves in cycles and share prices move in cycles. What might be cheap today might be expensive in six months time. What might be expensive in six months time might be cheap um, some, down, some time uh, further down the road. So this varies over time. So I actually have no idea what I'm gonna look at. So I sort of read, you know, like some uh, general stuff to get a sense of where things are. Um, and then the things that, you know, like when it is necessary, then I sort of narrow down into that specific industry. And with Google, with Twitter, with Seeking Alpha, with sources like Seeking Alpha and, uh, um, and, and, and like all the blogs out there, there are all these passionate people who are industry experts who are willing to share their expertise for free or, 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 or they charge you 10 US per month or something small like that. Who are, who are some um, of so the people? A, there is massive information out there. Joe, can, Kenneth, I'm, I'm really intrigued, right? So, so who are the people that you follow? Because there's a lot of them out there, all the way from Alarian to, you know, obviously uh, Ray Dalio, right? Who do you read? Uh... I can't remember any off the top of my head, honestly, <laughs> because I, uh, I, I just read it for the data points. I don't, I don't, I don't read it for the names. So I don't follow names per se. I just, you know, like uh, follow data points. But essentially, you, you know, like it's sort of a rabbit hole. And uh, what I realized is that with investing, there is no point in me telling you what what I look at because everybody's perspective, viewpoint, what they uh, think is important and not important is actually different because everybody, every, every, everybody approaches the market differently. So what is important to me might not be important to you. Uh, so Chuang, it's actually better for everybody to sort of, you know, like uh, finesse things, you know, take some effort to understand yourself and then sort of curate your sources accordingly rather than be, uh, you know, follow the generic stuff. Okay, so, so at this point in time, I'd like to ask, you know, the professional fund managers, what advice would you give to the young? Because the young, they come out, you know, um, they don't know a lot. They haven't seen the boomba cycles. They, they they're bombarded by information from everywhere. There's you know you go, you open YouTube. There's all these essentially snake oil salesmen trying to get them to invest in I don't know uh, bitcoins and you know these derivative products, which are all you know these are all basically money pits, right? You can lose a lot of money. Geneva Gold is another one. Uh, what would you, what advice would you give to the young? Mm, just. Just one piece, which is basically, you know, like time is on your side. Um, be long-term greedy. Don't be, don't be in such a rush. Um, basically, you know, like you need to let compounding work for you. And the best example of that is actually um, your money EPF, which is basically stuff. And, you know, like EPF is like returns about 6% per year. So according to the rule of 72, you're doubling your money every 12 years or so. So if you're only in your thirties, by the time you uh, you you um you retire in your seventies, you actually have you know like at least three cycles there, where you can turn one to two, two to four, four to eight. So you can actually turn one dollar to eight dollars very very nicely, with with without being in a rush. So be sensible about it. Time is on your side. Buy sensible stuff, um, and just try to make money slowly or, or compound wealth slowly. But within that layer, right, when you talk about how you look at price to book, you look at cash flows, but you don't look at banks, you don't look at telcos, you don't look at utilities. I mean, for a long time, China banks were trading at below one-time book value, which is incredible because some of them, by way of assets, are some of the biggest in the world, ICBC and Bank of China and what have you, right? Um, so which then begs the question, what, what is your point of view on China? Would you advise the, the pe well, people generally to look at China? And if, if not, why not? I would say that you need a diversified portfolio because the future is unknown. You don't know what how things will be in five years' time. In five years' time, you don't know what state China will be in. You don't know what state Malaysia will be in. You, there is some inclination, but you actually have no idea. So diversify. So rather than just pick one country or get so fixated on one sector or one hot technology or one country that will basically uh, do extremely well, diversify and trust experts. Diversify so across equities? Advice, Sorry, Kenneth, diversify across yeah. equities in different countries or diversify properties, gold, Bitcoin, what have you? Um, all, the, all of the above. So diversify across asset classes and also diversify across uh, um, your exposure. So 
why there is there is nothing to say that you only have to buy stocks in Malaysia or you have to buy stocks in Asia. Okay, there are there are stock markets in almost every country in the world. There are companies that are making money and like doing good business everywhere. So why? So there is no real limit. There's no real need to limit yourself. Um, let the experts do it. Buy a broad based unit trust that will give you that kind of exposure without you having to to do any of the work, and just sit back and and watch your money grow. So for the most part, a lot of people they don't have the time or the or the knowledge or the discipline. I think generally speaking, to invest on their own speed. So how do you choose the correct fund manager? On what basis do you choose? You know the uh, the appropriate money manager to 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 manage your money for you. Um, if nothing else, just go as broad as possible. Um, <laughs> uh, just go as broad as possible. If you're able to talk to the fund manager, understand you know like um, how the fund manager thinks, whether that person's uh, interests are aligned with yours, or whether they are just after asset accumulation and just keeping their jobs. So you know, like, there are so many different uh, factors at play. It, it, it's it's quite hard to um, sort of distill it down. But 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 you know, like don't keep it in cash. Whatever you do, don't keep it in cash. Waiting for that opportune moment to invest. Uh, keep on investing because you have time on your side. And over twenty years, you will make money in the stock market. Um, over ten years, I, I I think the statistics is that eighty percent of the time you actually be up over ten years. Over twenty years, you it's hundred percent that you actually be make, making money over the stock market. Um, so don't keep that money in cash. Invest it. Um, the future is uncertain, so diversify that exposure. Okay, so don't don't hold cash because right now cash the the risk free rate is something like one point seven five percent, which is way below inflation. So that that's intuitive. But just in terms of China, I want to talk about China again because you didn't really expand on that idea, right? Um, China has become a bit of a a regulatory trap because um, the end financial IPO didn't happen. The Chinese government got a bit, you know, um, crazy. Um, you know, this whole idea that they're trying to clamp down on, on data privacy. I don't really buy it, right? Because I think they just want to control more of the wealth. Um, then you also had things like Tencent and, you know, the the, the news seems to be widening ByteDance and TikTok and what have you. Um, wh- what is your opinion on China and how should investors approach China? As Warren Buffett says, right, like um, he has, he has, he has, he has sort of three traits: yes, no, too hard, and you know, like China, in my mind, sort of falls into the too hard category. Um, where so if you don't so understand it, right, you don't touch it. Yeah, correct. The thing is that you know, like um, there just other ways that are clearer uh, to me, or other sectors, or other countries that are clearer to me. Uh, China, I'm sitting here scratching my head as well, trying to figure it out. Um, so while I'm sitting here scratching my head and trying to figure it out, I would rather not put capital too much capital at risk, uh, or basically you know like put a pin out there because I actually have no control over it, because there is an invisible hand at work that you and I have no clue what their ob- objectives are. So it might be promising and all that, but is it promising to you and me? I'm not. I'm. I'm not. I'm not sure. Okay, so so the the other thing is obviously not as you say. Um, I can't remember your ratios, but you look for stocks which give you fifty to sixty percent upside, because because not every company will give you the fifteen percent return. So, something along those lines. So there will be winners, and yeah. then there will be losers, and then there will be some that only give you minimal returns, right? Um, how do you avoid the traps? Because if you go into the mid caps and the small caps, you can be stuck there for a long time. Because the interest is not there, the coverage is not there, they won't be on CNBC and Bloomberg, right? How do you avoid the traps? And especially being based here in KL, you're not among the thick, the thick of the action. I know a lot of fund managers do that. I, I know the Pangolin guy is based in KL, James Hay. I know that uh, Mark Faber has famously been in Chiang Mai for the last, I don't know, God knows, 20 years. I know Warren Buffett lives in Nebraska, in Omaha, which is, you know, deepest, darkest America. He doesn't live in Wall Street. So, so how do you avoid these traps and how do you view the markets when you're based in a very small and you know, insignificant part of the world? I try to let the numbers do the talking. So um, it's pretty good now where essentially um, companies report on a quarterly basis. So we're getting four updates a year from companies as in how things are doing. 
uh, not just what they say in commentary, but basically, you know, like from a numbers point of view, what are revenue, what is revenue growth like? What are profit margins like? Are expenses under control? Your capex plans? What they're spending? Um, capital management. So we're getting pretty. So as investors, we are getting pretty regular updates uh, from companies, and I find that basically, you know, like four data points a year are more than sufficient to make an informed decision. Um, the thing is that you know, like trends sort of take time to form, and I try not to be too early as well. Um, so I sort of, you know, like let trends form where for two or three or four quarters in a row, there is some sequential improvement uh, and sort of suggest that we are past the point of inflection. And that's when things get interesting for me. So that is how I sort of avoid the value traps by basically trying try not to be early. Uh, I'd rather be late rather than early um, and just, you know, wait for the quarterly data points. The beauty of investing in public equities is that you have daily liquidity. So it is not a case of you buying now and not and being unable to sell for the next three to five years. You buy it now based on you know three good data points quarterly, but then the next two data points might be terrible. You have the option of basically changing your mind and selling because things didn't go out according to plan. Yeah, okay, I'm glad you asked that because um... There have been some decliners in your portfolio, right? Um, I, I know you looked you, you looked at and, and basically got out of Kazikon Bank in Thailand, right? Uh, you got some you have, you put some money in Hynix as well. Hynix is one of the world's biggest uh, semiconductor companies. Uh, you also lost money there. Then I think you know Discovery Inc. I think is is that the media channel which does you know wildlife? I, I I'm not sure. Uh, Nickel mm-hmm. Mines yes, that's yes. obviously in mining and uh, metals lost money there. So what went wrong there and um, what was your thinking in terms of cutting loss and, and making sure it doesn't harm the portfolio? So the last 12 months has been a really interesting time. Um, a lot of times it's a case of, um, so, so the last 12 months, the portfolio has been running at 100% invested. So there's been no spare cash. Um, there are a lot of interesting mispriced opportunities out, out there at this point in time and space in the portfolio is limited. So with those opportunities, uh, it's a case of just finding a better mispriced stock or, or stock that's more mispriced than what they represent. So the, the, so the decision was to make rather than wait for this to turn around to essentially uh, sell and deploy it into something that is even more mispriced. I see. Okay, so you're very yeah. cold about it. So, um, yeah, okay. Mm-hmm. Uh, so for example, like with Kassikon Bank, um, you know, like just going back to the 2008 global financial crisis. I remember that basically everything crashed and then the stocks that led the recovery were the financial stocks in Indonesia, in Thailand, in Malaysia. So that was the thinking behind going in, uh, investing in Kasikom Bank, which was trading at a historical low of, I think it was 0.7 times price to book. Um, and, and, and yeah, it, it just looked that things were recovering. But then, you know, like um, as we saw over the last nine months or so, um, ASEAN hasn't really recovered from COVID. We're sort of, sort of stuck there. Economic, economic activity is sort of still very, very lackluster. ASEAN will eventually do well, but just not yet. So rather than wait for that to happen, the decision was made to sell our Kasikon Bank and deploy it somewhere else where uh, there was better recovery and there was better, um, and where the mispricing would close in a shorter period of time. Okay. Um, I also want to ask you about uh, foreign currency because you know, as an investor, you want to reduce as much uh, potential for volatility or, or maybe not. It, de- it depends how, how well you know markets, right? So I understand that uh, with your fund, you can invest either in US dollars or Sing dollars, right? So that puts the layer of um, Forex um, fluctuations within the portfolio. How much should investors look at foreign currency fluctuations when they invest abroad? And how can they iron out those fluctuations? Oh, that's a that's a really tough one. Um, so the so the popular run is essentially uh, long only unhedged. Um, so there is actually no decision or opinion made on um, currency, um, and I've sort of realized that I don't know the currency markets that well. So I've not made an attempt to basically hedge it or figure out where currencies are headed. Um, I'm essentially a stock picker, so I try not to look at stock. Uh, I, I try to look at currencies. Um, the assumption also is that, you know, if I can find a stock that can go up 50% and, 
it should also compensate for the fact if currency were to move against it by say two to three percent. That is uh, the that is how I sort of approach things. That basically, in the grand scheme of things, that currency shouldn't really matter if your if you if your stock picks can up, uh, deliver outsized performance. Yeah, that's the thing because um, especially if you're investing from say a Malaysia, right? And you're converting essentially your mm -hmm. ringgit income into Sing dollars or US dollars, and then if you stay ahead long term, the assumption is that if the ringgit weakens against the world's biggest currency, the world's reserve currency, then you will get a double effect, the double positive, right? The one concern that a lot yes. of people have is the fact that the US Federal Reserve has been, you know, very profligate with its uh, money printing the last 10, 15 years. They've in increased their balance sheet by manifold, right? And a lot of people are saying that the US dollar is dead in the water, that it's going to lose its status as a reserve currency, the yuan is going to take over, whether in solitary form or as part of a basket of currencies, right? What, what do you, how, how much do you, do, you, do you look at the Federal Reserve and how it's printing money? And in fact, the status of the US dollar as a, as a reserve currency over the long term? No firm opinion, to be honest. <laughs> uh, I look at it and it sort of falls into the camp of uh, what is my view on China? It's sort of like... Uh, uh, confusing and no clear view. Um, so <laughs> okay, so you're no very idea. focused in terms of uh, what you smarter look. people. Yeah, smarter people than me have have tried to explain this. Um, so I'll rather let them do it uh, because yeah, I have I have no clear view. I've 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 sort of realized you know like in order to make money in in markets, uh, I'd rather increase my 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 hit rate by only offering opinions on things that I'm really uh, certain about or have a, you know, like, uh, uh, yeah, or, or like more confident about. Everything else I sort of pass and, and I try not to answer it because I, my guess is as bad as yours or as good as yours. <laughs> so try to keep it simple. I think that's fantastic. So I think this begs the question then, I think perhaps uh, we're nearing the end of our session, but um, what do you do with your, your own money, um, Kenneth? I, I know you've got some skin in the game with your fund. But <clears throat> you know your your overall risk profile might not fit the fund in whole in whole terms, right? What do you do? What what is your thinking for your own money? What what do you look at? So I'm so going back to uh, so I'm looking to double money every five years. So even for myself, I'm basically looking to uh, compound wealth at fifteen percent per year, so that. I can double money every five years. And given a long enough uh, runway, uh, one to two, two to four, four to eight, eight to 16, 16 to 32, compounding is pretty powerful if you sort of let it run uninterrupted for many years. Um, so that's what I'm trying to do. And then, so it, using that as a, as a principle, then I take a step back and say, you know, like what tools can I use in order to get me 15% uh, per year, okay? Um, and I sort of um, rely very heavily on equities to get me there um, because I have the option of diversification um, and liquidity, which I think a lot of people don't fully appreciate. Um, the whole point is in, in, in order to compound wealth, uh, the asset that you own has to generate income. That's where, that's how the value of that asset increases over time. Um, so if you own a rental property, that is also an asset that basically helps you compound wealth by generating income. If you own a bar of gold, that doesn't generate any income at all. That just sits there and you actually have to pay security costs. Same with Bitcoin. Uh, it just sits there and you basically have to pay for, for security. Uh, so those are store, stores of value. Uh, they actually don't produce any income at all. So that, is, um, so that doesn't actually generate wealth. Uh, you generate wealth by basically um, buying assets that produces an income cash flow and that compound and you just let it compound over time. So I basically uh, have decided um, to put most of my wealth into the equity market. Um, I think overall I'm about 80% 80, 80 invested in equities and 20% in cash. Uh, I don't really put many money into property because property uh, liquidity is a big issue where you where investors should actually be compensated for the lack of liquidity. If I made a decision to sell a stock today, I get my money back in two days time, three days time. If I were to sell a property, 
I will still be waiting nine months or a year and I might not be, be getting my money back. Um, so, you know, like if you want to buy property or if I were to buy property, I need to be compensated for the lack of liquidity. Um, and, I, and at this point in time, I don't believe that the returns in the property market are super normal relative to the equity market to compensate for the lack of liquidity. Hence the decision to basically put basically most of the money into equities. Yeah, a lot of people are finding out to their chagrin that uh, they're stuck in the property market. Yours truly included. Um, but what about things like um, more esoteric or more exotic things like, uh, I don't know, Bitcoin? or stable coin or whatever, one of those cryptos which seem to be getting more um, establishment <coughs> approval. Uh, what about other things like, you know, maybe more esoteric markets around the world? Do you look at those things? Um, yeah, so I, so I look at everything um, just to basically, you know, like uh, keep it real and have, have a better perspective on equities. So, you know, like Bitcoin falls in the same camp as uh, gold and silver. Or you know, like um, if you go back, if you go back a thousand years ago, the same value as a chicken. You know, it, it is a store of value. There's no income there. It is a store of value, right? It's just that basically with currency and all that, it's become divisible and acceptable everywhere. Um, so the thing is that if I say that you know Bitcoin is worth whatever, I I need to find another buyer who's willing to buy it at that price. Same with gold as well. So you know, like I have nothing against Bitcoin or goal, it's just a case of, you know, like just be mindful of the game that you're playing in. Uh, and it's essentially a variation of the greater fool game, which is a fun game to play where, you know, like I say, Chong, you know, like Bitcoin is worth 50,000. Would you like to buy it from me at 50,000? You said, no, it's, you know, it's 30,000 in the market and maybe I'll transact at 30,000, but it's essentially, uh, it doesn't produce any income. It is, it is a variation of the greater fool uh, theory. Um, and when it comes to, um, other markets and all that, there is opportunity everywhere because, you know, like going back to the whole thing about cycles, the economic cycle that, we are, that we're seeing in every country sort of repeats itself everywhere. Uh, every consumer, every teenager in every country aspires to hold a can of Coca-Cola in their hand one day. So the guys in America do it on a regular basis. Maybe they consume too much and uh, the guys in, uh, uh, in, in Malaysia also want to do it. And maybe the guys in Indonesia, you know, do it once a, once a month. But, but, but like the boy in Africa also wants to drink Coca-Cola because, you know, the Western propaganda is so strong that th that is aspirational. Um, so what, whatever cycle, whatever sector cycle that you're seeing play out in this market will be playing out a slightly different version in a different market. And it's just basically appreciating the subtleties, the differences, where we are and all that. Uh, and yeah, it's, 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 it's actually quite interesting just comparing and contrasting. And it's sort of uh, same, same, but different everywhere. Fantastic, man. Thank you. Thank you for spending time with me, uh, Kenneth. Um, I mean, I, th I think your principles are evergreen, a bit like the company that you invested in. Uh, they will stand the test of time. And obviously, if Warren Buffett is any indication, you know, this is, this is you know, long-term growth of the highest uh, order. So thank you for sharing your thoughts. Um, I'll give you the opportunity, if you like, Kenneth, to just you know, talk about some parting shots, some advice to the young. In fact, some advice to the average investor, whether he's young or old. Um, you know, lessons to take away from your own principles, which are called over the better part of three decades. Um, just to focus on the long term. So everybody is sort of, uh, most people get caught up. Uh, over the fact that it, there is short-term volatility, what happens if I buy now and you know, like I lose money in the short term and all that. But the thing is that you know, always focus on the long term and buy and, and buy an asset that produces income, so that that will help you compound wealth over time. Um, just sh right over the, the the gyrations of the short term, take it as volatility uh, that doesn't cause permanent damage of uh, that doesn't lead to permanent loss of capital. So the whole point is essentially to keep keep playing the game for many many years and that's how you um, compound well and never lose your capital hey Kenneth thank you so much for your time um, if anybody wants to reach Kenneth obviously I'm going to share your social media down and, and contact details in the description below so thank you Kenneth and uh, good luck with investing for the rest of the year man okay thank you